Okay, so, <laughs> all right, cool. Um, uh, so I'm Justin, I'm going to talk today about Titan. Uh, it's a library I'm working on, uh, and it's a, the, the, the quick overview is it's a macro-powered FFI for LuaJIT. But I'm going to go into some different themes here uh, and talk about some of the, the possibilities I'm seeing uh, with, with FFI and, and uh, hacks and, and uh, JIT type interpreters in general. Um, quick notes about me. Uh, I wrote the Hacks Lua target, so this is kind of a, a persistent theme in most of my uh, uh, demos and projects that I've shown with the Hacks community. Um, I'm working on ML and data science at salesforce.com over in, in, uh, over in Bellevue. Um, I've been part of the Hacks community since 2006, so I've been uh, in, involved with it uh, since it was, I was doing a bunch of early like visualization work um, using the flash target for a while. So it's been uh, pretty much from the inception. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm living here in town. Um, and I'm also looking to start some more Seattle area hacks meetups. Uh, so if you're in the audience and have interest and, and want to get things on the calendar, let me know. My, my, uh, as a side note, my life has kind of stabilized a little bit. I recently moved and got my kid into school and uh, got myself uh, reoriented here. So this is kind of like I'm, I'm, I'm re-emerging uh, from my cocoon here lately. Um, so anyways, that aside, I want to talk to you about uh, Titan. Which is uh, for if you're if there's any uh, uh, space nerds out there, it's a uh, it's a it's a moon. Um, it's the second largest moon in the solar system. It's a promising planet for colonization. Uh, it's the only other dense atmosphere in the solar system besides our own. Um, there's abund abundant hydrocarbons and nitrogen. So this is uh, it's this massive, uh, it's this big moon in, around, around Jupiter. It's got a lot of uh, things that make it very similar. I lost HDMI here. Give it a second to come back. Right. So uh, this is uh, excellent sci-fi fodder. People always say, like, this is the next, uh, this is the next uh, place we should colonize. It's got all these nice attributes that are rare. Um, However, the, you get into the drawbacks. The days are 360 hours long. Um, there's oceans of liquid methane instead of water. And the surface temperature is a, uh, a brisk uh, negative 290. So um, there's some, some severe drawbacks, but it's still, like in terms, of a, uh, in terms of an environment, kind of compatible, at least on kind of the, the galactic scale. Um, oh, and also the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. We need, we'll need to solve that too, but no big deal. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, one of the themes here is um, uh, moons and adaptation. And uh, so I mentioned I'm working with Lua. Uh, Lua is Portuguese for moon. It came out of a Brazilian uh, research group there. Um, it's had a lot of success in quickly adapting uh, C code with its interpreter. So it's built as sort of a scripting layer on top of ANSI C. Um, there's another Im uh, implementation of that called Lua JIT, uh, which greatly ins improves the speed, uh, which, and it was way ahead of its time in terms of uh, achieving like V8 speeds for, for an interpreted JIT language uh, years before that, that hit, the, hit the scene. Um, it's got this great FFI, which I'll talk about a little bit here. Um, and it, and it kind of leads to this question, uh, you know, how can we adapt LuaJIT FFI with hacks and adapt to foreign environments slash runtimes? So the idea here is that um, there's, there's all this like fast running code out in uh, the land of C. There's all these great libraries. Um, and what, what can we do to have hacks kind of talk to that uh, fluently? Um, and so, Going in a little bit more detail there, like the, the FFI, what exactly is it? Why should I care? Um, foreign function interfaces uh, enable, uh, obviously, it's, it's the idea of like calling into another code base written in a different language and getting the results back. Um, and people are interested in this because slower uh, uh, interpreted languages are easier to work with, typically, because they're, they're, they're more flexible, they're a little more dynamic. Um, and then you can leave kind of the heavyweight processing for uh, faster compiled languages that take longer to compile. There's typically more checks. But once you've done all those checks and compiled it, you can you know, just call into it directly um, and take advantage of, of the speed and, the, and then the flexibility of the interpreted language. 
Um, and of course, this greatly speeds up performance in certain cases, but it involves a lot of abstractions between language concepts, because typically there's, there's uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better phrase, there's an impedance mismatch uh, between how you write those two uh, languages. Um, so naturally, there's big problems uh, that can happen, and, and this is, in, in some cases, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, the code that you're, you're winding up with now has like three abstractions that you have to keep in your head through this whole development process. Um, so if you're writing with an ha a hacks FFI, you've got to understand how hacks is interpreting the function. You have to understand how the FFI is interpreting the function. You have to understand how C is interpreting the function. So all these things kind of chain together, and when things break, you've got to know, like, well, where is it breaking? Like, what do I need to do? Like, what's sort of the lowest cost abstraction I can put on this so that I can get the, the performance back that I need? Um, and then naturally, the surface area for bugs is greatly increased, because these are all, like, um, you know, you can lock these down uh, during development, but then they're more or less, like, completely independent uh, things that can change. You may need to update certain layers um, at different times, and um, through all this, the surface area for bugs is is uh, is bigger. Um, and then when it comes time to ship, you're now you you now have to ship the binaries, and then figure out kind of how you're going to do that for the different platforms you're interested in, and, and make sure that everything's covered there. Um, and then just in general, like you know, I would I probably argue that not a whole lot of people do this <laughs> for fun. It's just it's problematic. It's painful. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of upsides, but it's a lot of complexity. So one of the one of the, the ideas here was just to make this a little easier to deal with, um, and and in, encourage experimentation, and then um, and hopefully you know I, I think this is kind of a, I see this more of a, a, a process of how we can get better at doing this as a community. Um, so I wanted to talk about Luigi at FFI uh, because it it has its own FFI already. Um, and one of the other, one of, I've, been, I've, I've been kind of following Lujet for a while, and I've been very impressed with um, just how well designed it is and then, and then the uh, minimal overhead. Um, so as this chart indicates, this is, uh, it incurs very low overhead for, for its FFI. And so this was just a dummy, like how many times can I call into the C function, let's, and then let's count how long that takes. It's very simple, like hello world type of thing. Um, and I don't know if these are, are completely le uh, legible down here, but um, Luigit is all the way over here, and I don't even know what number this is, but um, compared to the rest, uh, you know, getting into, uh, you know, even Node, it's, it's many, many times faster than Node. And then one interesting thing here is, this is C itself, right here. <laughs> so there's, there's reasons for that, I can't go into them here, but um, C externing into itself is slower than Luigit. Uh, uh, using its FFI, so, and there's trade-offs that Luigit makes to make it faster, and and uh, yeah, I don't want to go into that. But anyways, um, technically that's true. But roughly, you know, in practice, they're going to be more or less on par. Um, that under underlines the fact that it's very low overhead, um, and and there's a number of number of reasons for that. Lua itself was designed as a scripting layer for ANSI C, so it's already kind of set up for that. Um, the Lua JIT FFI was written by Mike Paul, who's kind of this um, superstar JIT author. Uh, as I mentioned, Lua JIT was way ahead of its time, and uh, Mike Paul's a big reason for that. Um, so anyways, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a very well-designed FFI, and I think like, um, if, you're, if we're interested in the notion of FFI in general, like this is a, a, a really good project to, to take a look at and pull, a, pull apart. Um, and if you're looking for more details on exactly why, the what and the why of Luigit and why it's so fast. There's, I, I've included a link to um, uh, the code used to generate these uh, these uh, performance numbers, and then also kind of an uh, analysis of what's going on. So it, it's already targeted by hacks. So, and I, I, I should have. Maybe added that in as a as a sub uh, a, a, a sub reference. Um, so when we released the hacks uh, target, it had support for uh, uh, Lua 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 with the compatibility flag. Lua JIT is like a subset of of uh, 5.1 and 5.2. So it we're covered completely there. Uh, but Lua JIT is distinct is 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 like a it's like a separate runtime 
for the Lua interpreter. Yes. But, well, you'll see, like, one of the things I worked on was supporting, I think it's five different versions. So it's both Lua JIT versions. I think the latest one is still kind of a, there's a beta version floating around. Um, and so every, every commit to the hacks um, compiler tests on all five versions of Lua, and it has to pass all the, all the tests. So it's fairly robust. I, it's, I think it's, it's probably better tested than most Lua uh, projects out there. Um, so it's I, 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 I'm pretty happy about that actually that took that was a lot of headache Thank you. That's, that's a lot of awesome work to get it done well. yeah I uh, it's 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 in real good shape so I think we're covered there uh, for, for Luigit and uh, yeah and I think that's I, I think it's also nice because um, yeah. uh, you don't have to worry about it really I, I think like unless you want to use very specific uh, uh, version specific features um, so like if you're targeting uh, uh, like if you want to use any of this FFI stuff, that's LuaJet only. So this is this is where I'm kind of narrowing it down. But the the language support in general is um, whatever version you want, provided you. I think in 5.3 there's the caveat if you have to compile the backwards uh, compatible uh, some of the extensions and APIs there. Um, but that's that's doable in in most cases. Um, so right. Uh, so that was the LuaJet FFI overview. Um, and then I want to just talk a little bit about the usage, which I also think is is really slick. Um, uh, you can see here how you know that there's here here are the steps. You're loading. This is in Lua code, by the way, um, taken directly from uh, the FFI uh, documentation. You load the library, then you add a C declaration. So so inside these brackets, that's a Lua idiom for um, kind of like a multi-line quote. Uh, we're giving a C declaration for a function, um, and then we're calling the name function, and that's it. That's it. We just made it. We just F, it was an FFI into a, a C function. And really, like if you look at other, if you look at other FFI implementations, there's all kinds of other stuff you have to do, but this is it. This is this is all you need to do to to kind of hotwire directly into a, a into a C function call. Um, now, this carries with it some overhead because there's going to be some conversions that Lua does kind of under the, under the hood uh, whenever values are passed in or out of these uh, FFI, FFI functions. I'm not expecting you to read all these, but this is um, just a kind of overview that they've covered a lot of bases there. So it's everything from pointer dereferencing to casting, and um, all of these play out uh, with, with Lua idiom, so you have control over that. You just need to know how the idiom maps to the Lua code FFI. Um, how, you know, and, and then some of these are kind of awkward, mainly because you've got a language like Lua which doesn't have direct memory access and it has to emulate or you know, map to like some kind of pointer dereferencing. Um, so just throwing this out there, like yeah, Lua is, is kind of awkward because its, it's type system is so simple. Um, and so when I was looking through this, I was like, oh, well, hacks has abstracts. Like we can kind of wrap you know, something prettier around this and, and have it make more sense. Um, and then you look at how uh, Lua does conversion, LuaJIT does some conversions. Um, and so you can map a whole bunch of uh, C standard types to, uh, Lua only has one numeric type in uh, uh, 5.1 and 5.2. I think in 5.3 they introduced a, an integer type, but it's still, it's experimental. Lua is very slowly with features, uh, with feature adoption, so um, that's one of the, the, the drawbacks there. But everything kind of maps to these very simple types in Lua. Um, that, given how easy that is, though, like just passing information in and out of FFIs, there are some headaches when you try to you know, ramp up the complexity of what you try to do with the C code. Um, the standard value types are more or less easy to convert, but lose res resolution. So, you know, when you're when you start doing some high precision math, et cetera, there's get, you're going to hit some um, some surprises there. Uh, the table array conversion is quirky because Lua only has tables. There is no uh, kind of first class array in, in Lua, so uh, it has to interpret what you're passing in uh, using certain rules, which I won't go. I, I don't think I, oh, okay, I did. So Lua has a one-based indexing scheme, which you can imagine is, it causes confusion, but in it, the FFI tries to detect that. I don't want to go into the details there. Does value padding to avoid passing in like a null array. 
Um, and then uh, any nulls in the array terminates the array. So there's some quirks there with how Lua is handling kind of the base table to array conversion. Um, and then whenever you have uh, structs and methods for CDEFs and you need your signatures, um, you know, with, with simpler standard I.O. stuff, you can just copy paste it in. But with more complex, you know, live quote unquote header files, like there's all kinds of extra stuff thrown in there and you need like more formal rules for determining like how that signature actually is interpreted by the compiler. Um, and then when you paste it in, you know, it's an inline string. It doesn't have any syntax highlighting and it sort of garbles up your, your, uh, your code. Um, so one thought is like, you know, I thought, well, rather than like just copy pasting strings, like can we just import the header whole hog and somehow do the right thing so that hacks on the other end, you know, can interpret all those method definitions and structs and, and you know, map, do things appropriately. But of course it's not easy. Um, when you look at like a header file, like if you actually look at something, like if you're on OS X, you can, you can dig into uh, uh, the libraries and how OS X does that. And there's all these uh, uh, pragmas and, and uh, macros uh, to guide the compiler to select the right uh, signature. Uh, so whenever you're, if you were to try to import this file, it's, there, most of it, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, all of the uh, 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 pre-processing macro stuff that, that Hacks does. Like it's, it's not pure source code in, in a strict sense. There's all these um, hash ifs every, littered everywhere and it's difficult to know exactly what, um, uh, what, what is the correct signature in some cases. Um, and then also uh, the header file, like there's just a bunch of useless stuff in there uh, in, in many cases, like obviously comments and then um, you know, in many cases, you're just interested in the methods and the, and the structs. Um, the, the, the other big thing that I, I found and that was really helpful is this, uh, this Clang compiler. Uh, has this really nice uh, AST export mode. Um, so this is, I think, kind of like one of the, the, the keys to this puzzle. Um, so you can just pass in, you can just point it at uh, header file you want to, uh, to to parse and pass in this AST dump fun, uh, argument and you get back the, the content on the right. This is just, I don't even know what this is, but it's just, this is what Clang will tell you about uh, the contents of that header file. And the nice thing is, is that this is basically an attachment to a compiler. So the compiler is telling you exactly what it sees. You can add in whatever pragma or definitions or, you know, define it however you want. You'll get back exactly what the C compiler would see um, for all those arguments. So it's sort of, I, I think this goes a long way towards solving the parse problem of, of like a header. Like you can configure this the way you want um, and then you can get a very well structured uh, description of, you know, what are the main, what are the methods, what are the structs and how are those related uh, inside the code. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's, it, you, you know, you can follow Pragma metadata directors this way. Um, and then, of course, once you have an AST, it's hierarchical anyway, so you can, you can parse it, you can uh, filter it, you can pick out the parts that you want to export. Um, and uh, the other big benefit of Clang is that, you know, it's, it's now pretty much broadly available. Like, you should be able to get it on, on just about any platform you want. Um, so, I've kind of tied together, like, all the main themes and pieces, and here's, you know, how um, you work with all these pieces in, in Titan and how it, it brings those together. Uh, so Titan uses, uh, we're looking at a, on the right here, we're looking at a, an, an XML, HXML build file. Um, and you'll notice that most of this is pretty standard. We're calling out a main and um, calling out the Titan lib. And then we're, we're, uh, we have two macro definitions here where we're calling into a Titan specific macros, telling it to include these header files. And so uh, this is, um, you know, we're passing in standard IO and then passing in some other random header. Uh, and you can basically include however many files you want, and then we're just going to run it. Um, and as I, so as I was saying before, the, the compiler macro basically consumes that, that header file and is going to apply Clang to it to ex, to, with whatever other arguments you want uh, to parse it, find which methods to export, um, which structs to export, and then uh, put, it's going to put that in the Titan namespace. Um, 
theoretically, I could, I could expand this to folder support as well, but uh, for now, you're just pointing at individual files. Um, and of course, I, as I mentioned before, this is only supporting Lua target with Lua JIT runtime. Um, and then when you're, when you're using it inside a main class, when you're actually writing the hacks code, uh, all you need to do is just, uh, when you've passed in those uh, compiler directives, now all of a sudden all of those, those methods and structs that you wanted are, in, are attached to the Titan namespace, the Titan class. The macro will build all that, um, and you'll have the ability to just create a new, you know, create a new struct, or call that printf uh, function from, from standard I.O. Um, so everything is, uh, everything's accessible, static methods, um, and uh, structs are abstracts with constructors. Uh, this is something you can, once again, something you, I, you know, you, we can do with the LuaJet FFI. Um, I've mapped the constructor, the hex constructor into the specific FFI calls that you need to make. Um, and then when you're developing with Titan, um, you might, Titan's kind of still a low level uh, mechanism for, for mapping into FFI functions. If you want to do something cross-platform, you still need to kind of act, you, you need to organize those uh, with, you know, more properly within a hacks namespace. Titan can't make those decisions for you. So if you wanted to have like a cross-platform sleep function, for instance, um, you would import, you know, both the header files for Windows and Linux, and then you would create a new, another class or module called sleep, and then you do a system name check and see which system you're on, and then call the call into the FFI for that um, for that method. So here in this case, you can see switching on the system name um, on Windows. There's a uh, a sleep method that's specific to that. Um, so we can you know expect the argument in milliseconds, uh, and then on on Mac, that's going to use the Linux uh, style standard I/O, and you can just call into the poll method for that. Um, so that's another kind of design principle. Like Titan is still very low level, and you'll need to organize the uh, the calls. If you want to do a cross-platform API, you'll need to organize it um, with uh, in, a, in another class implementation. And I'm basically just repeating all that. Oh, and then naturally, whenever you're distributing this, don't forget to you know obviously you have to still package everything up, include all the compiled uh, libraries when you're distributing your code. Um, so what can you do with Titan? Well, like right now, Titan's so new, it's basically you can do anything that's already possible with LuaJet FFI. Um, so I'm including some examples here of uh, specifically, I think, like single file headers work well. Um, so I'm just going to uh, call out a couple ones that I think are really fun to work with. There's a single file uh, GUI uh, library called Nuclear that's that's really fun, and I'll, I'll show a quick demo for that later. Um, there's, I don't, I don't really, I have to be honest, I don't know how to pronounce this. But Im Imgui, I am Gui. Okay, and I think, and I saw recently it's changed its name to Deer I am Gui. Yeah, and I, I don't know the details on that, but uh, it's a little bit older than Nuclear, and it's also, um, and you can find some fancier examples for that. Uh, but these are these are not these are very these are simpler. What's called like immediate mode GUIs. They're not doing any of the fancy React um, style uh, state changes. Um, but you can still do a lot of do a lot of complicated things with it. Um, then some other uh, uh, authors have put together um, some cross-platform or some some low-level uh, single file header. Uh, MMX is good for JSON. It has a web server in there as well. So if you wanted something really fast um, and uh, single file, uh, these are these are some of the good ones that I've I've, I've been playing around with. And I should mention that, you know, I showed, like, you can include multiple uh, headers with Titan. Um, but the problem is, is that, once again, there's still another pain point there because uh, this isn't so bad for Linux, but Windows is real, like, scatters its libraries everywhere. And, um, uh, and then you have to zip it, and there's, you know, there, there, it's, it's more, more impedance there. So uh, I think right now, given that this is still kind of in an experimental phase, I, you know, I'd, I'd recommend, like, starting with a simpler, like, single header. Uh, and it's a lot easier to distribute, a lot easier to play with, and there's no risk of like absolute accidentally clobbering a function in the namespace or you know uh, making a mistake like that. Um, so uh, wanted to recap. So.
going back to the kind of coming back to the the, the caveats for this. Um, C only has this one namespace. It's technically four because it's got tags and types and labels and members of type unions. But when you're when you're talking about methods and structs and, and kind of the first class big um, instances you're you're working with, um, it all goes into one namespace. So you have to keep that in mind whenever you're importing all of your uh, uh, headers. Um, so so Titan basically it just attaches that to its own uh, 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 class name, um, and it. And it's and it has this sort of single namespace, and then it's and then as a, as kind of a good design practice, you need to build on that and kind of organize the the uh, organize the functions into to platform specific implementations, and then um, and then provide a cross platform implement uh, wrapper around them. Um, the other big recap is that you know I I guess going back to this namespace problem, it's just it's just something inherent to see. You need to work around it and and um, and but I but it's clearly possible to do that. Um, and then the other the other key point here is now with the the JIT style interpreters. Um, these are these can be extremely fast in some cases marginally faster than um, working with with C code. Um, although those that has those are kind of fairly contrived cases, but still like it's you know it, it it's it's in it's in the ballpark there. Um, so if, if most of your code is in kind of a faster C path and you just need, you know, an interpreted code kind of to organize it, um, uh, you, can get a, you can get a big benefit from that. Um, and then kind of also just uh, calling out once again that Clang kind of handles this header parse problem, I think, pretty well. Um, and it gives you a lot of control over how you can kind of see, quote unquote, the, the header Exactly the way the C the C compiler sees it, um, and then adapt the um, how the, how you choose to import things accordingly. So that's that's a uh, that's a big benefit there. That's a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and then and then going further, like if we're looking to, to talk more about FFIs, um, I, I think the LuaJet has a fantastic FFI for for C for C interfaces. Um, you know, we should look to, you know. Emulate that, I think, or or see what we can take from it. But the, the caveats there is that Lewis started out as kind of an ANSI C uh, scripting language, so it kind of has that in its DNA. Um, and then it also has the benefit of, of Mike Paul is this fantastic um, uh, JIT uh, creator, and he's he's put a lot of love into that. Um, so there's two or three really good good things there going for uh, uh, for uh, Lua and C FFIs. So ne the next big question is when can I use this? And uh, I debated whether to, to try to push this out in the version I have now. I can show a demo of it working, um, but it's still not quite finished. And so I think like I'm 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 kind of using this uh, conference as a way to to bounce some ideas off people and see because I I'm not actually a uh, uh, an expert at FFIs. This is sort of an experiment for me, and there's a lot of of uh, problems you can run into. Um, one of them being uh, finding a good GC pattern. Like whenever you're dealing with the uh, the FFI code and you're constructing things, um, obviously C doesn't doesn't do much there for you, and you got to clean up after yourself. So if you want to, if you want, Hex has sort of GC by default. Um, outside of some specific cases with the C++ target, where you can kind of tweak some things. Um, but when you're dealing with dealing with FFI code, it's once again you're in the, the deep end of the pool there and have to uh, figure that out yourself. Um, I mentioned before, like uh, I think most people, like you know, if this moves out of an experimental phase into something more complicated, you need. Uh, I think this needs like a better first class way of organizing uh, some of these dependencies, um, and that's mainly the culprit there is Windows. I don't. That's that's something I'm not familiar with. Um, so happy to talk to, to people who have any who have dealt with that before, um, and then also like right now everything is is more or less automatic. It only handles like simple examples, but you can just import the header in, and and um, Titan will automatically give you the the API. Um, but in many cases, you may want to tweak the generated code to add in some different functionality, um, or to you know call into some other methods. So I think right now it's on the I, you know, I can, I can, it can go both ways. It can be completely automatic, or um, it could just be a, co a code generator. And I'm trying to get a feel for, you know, what works, what would be the best way forward there. Um, so that's the end. 
Um, and I can take some questions, but first, I, I just want to go back to the, 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 the initial theme of Titan um, being sort of, it's this, it's this good, uh, it's, it's this uh, moon, of, moon of Jupiter, it's this fodder for science fiction. And um, if, you wanna, if you wanna go see the best mediocre Netflix film on this right now, um, there's actually a movie called The Titan, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a movie about um, an experimental program to adapt human beings to uh, the atmosphere of Titan, which involves a lot of physiological changes, as, as you can imagine. Um, uh, but that said, um, as a contrast to the Luigi FFI, I'm trying to make it as painless as possible so you don't have to turn yourself into an alien uh, to survive in the, uh, the sea header world. So anyways, that's my, I, I kind of stretched that premise a little thin, but thanks for bearing with me. And yeah, any questions? Yeah, yeah. It would basically, um, the macro process would, would just hardwires itself into the Clang tool chain. Um, um, so, the, yeah, that's a good, good point. So the question was, um, does the Clang tool chain need to be part of the developer uh, environment? And, and yes, it does. So you would need to, uh, that would need to be present to create, for the macro to work, to interpret the, the parsed header and then uh, generate the code. That's the that's the trade-off with um, code generation versus automatically in, importing. And I know, um, so I think when I when I went in kind of gung ho, I know there's uh, hacks can automatically import uh, jars, for instance, um, and and a lot of people like that. They don't want to have a bunch of code. If they don't, if they just you know can look at the original API and just and go straight straight there, um, but as I've kind of got kind of hit more and more obstacles in FFIs and and kind of the map mapping back and forth, I'm realizing that maybe it's better to have those static files and to tweak them. Um, but the problem there is that it's you know that's typically kind of like a one way uh, transformation because once you start tweaking things, then you can't you know update it again without revisiting the whole process of so I think like that's that's kind of the discussion some of the discussions I wanted to have. So maybe over a beer. <laughs> so um, this is something else that would be uh, enabled via some other option in the compiler like you you know we could easily pass in here's the you know some C uh, definitions that Clang should use within Titan um, and then but then since I was just using my 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 core OS headers it already knew what to do there so um, I think that's sort of the uh, you know right now this is kind of meant for for almost, I would say strictly experimental purposes. It's not meant for production code. So for me, it was just like, how do I play around with these these function definitions and just uh, get them going? And I, I'm realizing I didn't show the demo. So um, uh, we can just call in. This is using this is using the uh, uh, nuclear uh, GUI. So you can. You, you don't have to recompile C every time to play around with this. You can just make smaller changes and then call into the call into the FFI. Um, and the and the, the the nice thing about this is it's so fast. Like I you know I just downloaded the, the header file. I didn't need to worry about like any any like compiler options or, or anything. I just pointed Clang at it and then pointed the FF pointed the uh, the JIT FFI at those uh, header definitions and it just worked. So, like, if a, if a shiny new C library comes out and you're like, oh, I want to try playing around with that, like, what is, you know, like, how does this GUI actually look? Um, you know, you can very quickly kind of mock that up and, and get going with it. So, um, and that's, and it, and it works now, but I think, like, if, if you want to make this more for real, like, obviously, 
it needs kind of more of a production path, and that's a lot more configuration. Oh man, so I read the blog post on this and uh, it has something to do with uh, call tables and how um, there's a trade-off that, that LuaJIT makes where it just, uh, it basically uh, calls directly into um, the header table for the compiled C method, whereas C actually does something that enables you to share code in a, in a certain way. So it's a little more, it avoids redundancy, but at the cost of making things slightly more expensive to call. So um, yeah, like if, I think if you're, you know, just writing like an interpreter and just kind of calling in, picking and choosing different things to call into, that would make sense. But if you're, you know, exercising all of the code in a, in a, in a given C library, then it, it, the, the overhead probably starts adding up. So, and we're talking about like, you know, milliseconds here. It's, it's, it's mainly just the curiosity um, and, uh, than anything, but they're, they're on par, uh, which is, is, uh, is, is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, and I haven't played around with them, but they're sort of like the old standards that okay, have been around. So what I'm thinking of doing is something along the lines of every binary module had a, like an eye on how many states, and then you could enumerate the lines. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is thinking about how would I use the Lua J idea of working with the site. Yeah, I think the um, if you want dynamic behavior, it has to be in the runtime. Um, so what you do is import everything into just one giant shared namespace, and that's the trick. Because um, the more libraries you try to Im import, you know, across different platforms or whatever, like the higher the chance that there's a, a, a some kind of name clash. Um, so there's some tricks, and, and I'm only talking about like the uh, s standard C style headers now. Um, I, d I don't know specifically if DLL has a workaround for that, but the way you solve this over in uh, Unix land is you um, write a wrapper for it and then change the names in the wrapper and, and call into the original file. So there's ways to work around things, but once you start working with multiple libraries, you have to deal with that. So I think in, the, in, your, in your case, it's possible, but I think like the, the best thing to do in, or the way that it has to work right now in Titan, is everything has to be in the same namespace. And then in the runtime, you have to figure out like what platform you're on or what kind of uh, what's what you specifically need, and then call into that specifically named I'm, I'm method. Sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't clear. That was my question. So... Oh, okay, yeah, okay. we can talk offline. I'd be happy to talk. Okay. Yeah, thanks, guys.